this is a statement I often make to Latter-day Saints that kind of, mm, wow, and which is that President Kimball was going to lift the ban the minute he became the church president. That's a statement where I hear a pin drop in the room because that's obviously not the, the line that you read in a manual, right? But of course, I make that determination based on several different things, one of which is this diary that I have thoroughly reviewed. He's not a guy to push the boundaries, but he doesn't believe that black people are cursed. And as he's visited, or as he's attended or visited state conferences, especially in, in uh, South America and Brazil, he'd, he'd have these black people who would approach him, these black Brazilians, and they would say, oh, we, we're, we pay our tithing, black men, we pay our tithing and we're just, we wanna go on a mission, we wanna marry in the temple, and I, we, we just, we love the church. And oh my goodness, President Kimball agonized over that, just agonized over it. So it's human dimensions that just pull at his heartstrings. And in 1963, he told his son in a private letter, he said, the ban may, quote, be a possible error. Now, this is private. He would never say this in public. So he, he becomes a president in 1973. Why in the heck does it take until 1978? That's the million dollar question, right? That's Dr. Matt Harris. He's a professor of history at Colorado State University, Pueblo as well as the author of several books on Mormon history. I'm Nick Stainback, and today on the Talk Mormonism podcast, I had the opportunity to interview Matt. We talked about the book he co-authored in 2015, The Mormon Church and Blacks. It's an in-depth documentary history that details the nearly 130-year period in which black Mormons were restricted from priesthood and temple participation. Matt is also the author of Watchmen on the Tower, Ezra Taft Benson and the Making of the Mormon Rite, and the LDS Gospel Topics Essays, a scholarly engagement. Both were released last year. He also has an upcoming book, tentatively titled The Long-Awaited Day, Blacks, Mormons, and the Lifting of the Priesthood and Temple Ban, scheduled for publication next year. At the start of our interview, I asked Dr. Harris what it is about this topic in particular that inspires him to dedicate so much of his time and study to writing about it. That's a good question. Um, so having grown up in the church, um, I was aware of the priesthood ban. I was a kid when it was lifted in 1978. And it was about the time that I was getting baptized. So I would have been eight at the time. Now I'm dating myself, Nick. And um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so I was eight years old. I was getting baptized. And I remember uh, right around my baptism, um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And I would later move to Maine when I was 10. But anyway, I was baptized in Phoenix at the age of eight. And it was right around that time where the priesthood restriction had been lifted. So I remember that as a young boy. I remember my parents talking about it. I remember other people in the ward talking about it. And as I got older, um, of course, as a missionary, I served a mission to Idaho in the late 1980s, early 90s. And I remember teaching Black men in particular. And they frequently asked about the ban, and I didn't have a good answer for them. And, and I both. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. I don't, probably not a lot has changed just because the church, in my opinion, didn't really prepare us to handle these things, other than to read what some other uh, leaders had said about it was either we don't know why they couldn't hold the priesthood, or there was always an appeal to the Bible, just as God had excluded certain people. Anyway, none of that ever satisfied me. I just didn't feel right about teaching those kinds of things. And so we were left to our own devices. And as I got older, I thought about this and decided to be a professor. And um, first part of my career, my early books and writings were in early American history, the revolution and the early Republic. And then in the last 10 or 12 years, I've turned to Mormon studies. And that's how I got involved really just trying to understand how this ban occurred and why it was lifted and the effect that it had on the church. And so that's, that's, I would say that's pretty much how it uh, originated. It, it, does it, um, does it come at all from a feeling that the narrative around the topic has been mismanaged? Yeah. I mean, a little bit because there is some, as you know, Nick, from serving a mission, even though we were generations apart, I'm sure your mission was probably not unlike mine in that we just didn't have any material. There was nothing in the missionary handbook that 
told us about lineage and um, blacks and the priesthood restriction. And so we were left to reading general authority books and just, you know, spouting or touting their opinions. And so I remember uh, Mormon doctrine, for example, um, I had a companion, uh, I, I served in Idaho, which is where my mission was. And I remember in Pocatello, Idaho, this missionary companion of mine, uh, we were teaching a black man and we were both struggling in terms of how to uh, address his concerns about racism and the priesthood ban. It was really hard. And my companion appealed to Mormon doctrine. And he said, it was in our apartment. And he said, I've got a book here by Elder McConkie. And Elder McConkie had been dead for probably four years by that point. And my companion said, uh, well, we're just going to have to give it to him from Elder McConkie. And I said, well, what does Elder McConkie say? And he read a passage called Negroes, yeah, that they were cursed and less valiant. And I thought, no, we can't say that to him. That's not going to help us get him in the church. And, <laughs> and my companion said, well, it's an apostle. We've got to teach it to him. And I, I was flummoxed. I didn't know what to say. He was appealing to an apostle. And I had nothing to appeal to other than my own humanity. And, and needless to say, when we read a Mormon doctrine to him, he was not interested in joining. So that was a kind of a tough pill to swallow. And I didn't know, um, maybe you know this, but uh, I didn't know then what I know now, which is, of course, Mormon doctrine was a very controversial book. We uh, had, a, had a copy of it in our apartment also uh, wasn't used in uh, teaching. And I think by that point, it was even probably looked at with some skepticism. Uh, but we had it nonetheless, I think it was still viewed as uh, on some level authoritative. So where do you think the narrative sits now for the average Latter day Saint, if we went and grabbed the grabbed a, a, a random member of the church off the street and just asked them, what do you know, or what's your understanding of um, the priesthood and temple restriction? What do you think we'd hear? I'm sure we'd get varied responses, but um, on the ground level, what do you what do you think? Well, it uh, depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to an older person, like say Nick, your grandparents, I'll assume they're maybe in their I don't know, let's say 70s or something, then they would probably quote Bruce McConkie or his father-in-law, the church president Joseph Fielding Smith. And between Elder McConkie and President Smith, those are the two leaders that had published books that most Latter-day Saints learned their the priesthood restriction from. Um, Smith's book is called The Way to Perfection. It was published in 1931. It's gone through several iterations, and it wasn't finally removed from print until 1989, 1990. And then Elder McConkie's um, best-selling book, was published in 1958 and wasn't removed from print until 2010. And so these two books, um, thousands of Latter-day Saints bought them, read them, and of course, President Smith and Ellen McConkie had lots to say about the ban. So if you're an older generation, you would probably quote President Smith or Elder McConkie. And, um, and this would be some form of ideas of curses. Cur yeah, this would be an pain. idea that following this biblical story that not only Mormons believed, let's be clear on this, Latter-day right. Saints are not unique to this. Protestants and Muslims and Jews even um, bought into this stuff. But so the curses would be one, patterned after Cain and, and then a biblical figure named Ham. But also Joseph Fielding Smith taught that, that, um, that God is just and he denied certain people privileges. And he likened that story to the restriction on Blacks. And after um, President Smith died in 1970, the, the First Presidency created a new uh, justification for the ban. They said, we don't know why it took so long. And that justification held sway well into the 21st century. So if somebody were to ask a, a missionary, perhaps, they might say, we don't know why. Right. That was kind of the easiest way to do it. And if the missionary was well-versed with McConkie and Smith, they might quote the Bible and certain groups being excluded, you know, all that stuff. Hmm. But the we don't know why is deeply problematic because obviously Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie never taught that. We know why Blacks were denied the priesthood. And it's, it occurs to me that it's almost, um, I don't know if you would agree with this, it's almost a form of presentism to now, I guess, project 
our view of what counts as, as doctrine onto the past and, you know, be able to point at it and say, well, this was not doctrine um, when we can, you know, go back and, and see that at least at that time for the people during that time, it very much was doctrine, very much was authoritative. Um, so I see that as slightly problematic to, and a form of presentism. Well, I think context is always so important. It's easy right. to, it's easy. I just had a book on Ezra Taft Benson, um, the late church leader, and it's easy to criticize Elder Benson for some of his conspiratorial views, right? He had a lot of conspiracy views and some of them were just, they just were nutty. They were, right? The government's right. fluoridating the water and Dr. King's a communist. I mean, that, that's just nutty stuff. But on the other hand, you know, you got to put Elder Benson in, in context when he was teaching these views. There was a Cold War going on. The Russians were doing some crazy things. And it's the same thing with the priesthood ban. That um, when the Brethren said in 1970, we don't know why that the priesthood was held. When I say the Brethren, it's the first presidency. Um, it was the civil rights movement. And the, the leaders were taking on criticism from every quarter both from Latter-day Saints in the church and, Latter and, and people outside of the church. And so really it's a throwaway line to say, get off our backs, leave us alone. Let us, we're not a member. You know, why do you care what we teach or believe? It's our religious belief. And to you members, be quiet. <laughs> Don't <laughs> right. criticize, right. Trust, right. trust the Lord, trust <laughs> us. And so, but, but it's the civil rights movement that really leads to that statement. Um, we might go back and Nick for a moment. Yeah, uh, we were talking about if you want to, uh, should I talk about the doctrine, how the the doctrine unfolds or the priesthood restriction unfolds? Yeah, let's do that. Well, for a lot of years, um, let me let me start with a story. In um, in the early 19th, 20th century, there was a, an assistant his church historian named Andrew Jensen. So he worked for the church. He worked at church headquarters. And Andrew Jensen did something that just annoyed the heck out of the brethren. <laughs> he published a four-volume book called, I think it's called the LDS Encyclopedia, something like that. I think it's online. You might be able to find it online. Well, in one of those encyclopedia entries, it's just a, a, a montage of entries of church figures in history. He included an entry by a black man named Elijah Abel. And he said that Elijah Abel held the priesthood. And when Latter-day Saints are reading this encyclopedia in the 20th century, this is all new to them. A black man held the priesthood in the early years of the church. And so they wrote into uh, church leaders in the 20th century, President David O. McKay, um, his counselor, J. Reuben Clark, Joseph Fielding Smith, one of the great um, doctrinal teachers in the church, who, who was also not just an apostle, but a church historian. So they're writing into the brethren and they're asking him, can you tell us about this Jensen guy? What, what did he mean when he said Elijah Abel's held the priesthood? And it became really, really difficult for the brethren to handle because if you believe that Joseph Fielding, or Joseph Smith, the founding prophet, had instituted this priesthood ban, then how is it that a person on the LDS church payroll can say that a black man held the priesthood. And that's really, really problematic. And so the brethren would write back to these inquisitors, these Latter-day Saint inquisitors, and some of them would just say, uh, President McKay says that it was an exception. And um, <laughs> my favorite is Joseph Fielding Smith. He writes back to this lady from Logan and he said, no, there were two Elijah Abels at Nauvoo and the guy that held the priesthood was the white Elijah Abel. Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> so they, it doesn't really fit with the church narrative. Is there any evidence that there was anyone, I guess, who stopped for a minute and said, okay, let's, you know, try to investigate this, treat this, you know, with some legitimacy. I, I see just um, efforts to hold ground that is being lost. And so I'm just wondering... Uh, does anybody pause for a minute to uh, investigate this further? And because because it seems to me that this could this could have been a you know a, a, a turning point right then right then and there. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, so they do talk about it because the descendants of Elijah Abel um, also received the priesthood, his sons. And uh, you can talk to Professor Reeve about this. He's done some work on Elijah Abel's too, so you might ask him as well. But um, so Elijah Abel's two sons were also ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood. And the best sense that we have is that his sons had... Um, had flown under the color line, as it's called. That is, they passed off as white. Because I don't think that when his sons were ordained in Logan, Utah in 1930, that people were bucking the brethren. Oh, we're going to ordain this black guy. Who cares what they think? <laughs> I don't think that at all. And But the brethren themselves, they did talk about Elijah Abel. Um, the first presidency minutes are full of, there's talk about his name. And this is in 1879. So, of course, the prophet Joseph Smith is dead by 1844. And in and around that time, uh, when does Brigham Young die? I think it's 1879, somewhere in there. And so they're talking about his status, and they come to the conclusion at this meeting that they have that it was a mistake, that we shouldn't have ordained him. It was a mistake. So they're aware of it. The problem is, though, is that in the 20th century, there's a lot of apostles who teach that the band began with Joseph Smith. And so when you say that a black man was ordained to the priesthood during Joseph Smith's tenure as founding prophet, um, that doesn't fit well with that narrative. Additionally, we've learned since then that there are at least a handful of other black men who have held the priesthood. They've had some temple uh, ordinances done. Elijah Abel is one of them. Joseph Ball is a, is a black man who served as a um, branch president in Boston. So we've got about five or six black men who held the priesthood. So now we've got a problem going on with this, 20, this narrative. It's easy to say, like President McKay said, that Elijah Abel's was an exception, not the rule. But you can't have five or six other footnotes, right? And so, so what happens is, is that Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie uh, and others they had taught that the ban began with Joseph Smith, but there was no evidence for it. There was no revelation. There was no writing. And to the contrary, uh, by 1852, there's strong evidence that Brigham Young is the one that institutes this ban. And so um, the, I know we'll talk about it later in this broadcast, but the race and priesthood essay that was church published in 2013, um, they acknowledged for the first time in 2013 that the band began with Brigham Young. Right. And they also acknowledged that uh, black men, plural, not singular, black men held the priesthood, at least some, during the early days of the church. So, um, but anyway, so there were a lot of theories going on in the 19th century about black people, about priesthood ordination. And uh, there, was, there was one theory that occurred um, by the 1870s, so this would have been a few decades after the publication of the Pearl Great Price. And when they canonized the Pearl Great Price in the 1870s, this is, you know, Abraham, I'm sure you're familiar with chapter two, where it talks about the premortal right. existence. Well, um, one of the general authorities, B.H. Roberts, uh, he's not the first to do this, but he's the one that sort of popularizes this idea that Black people were less valued in the pre-Earth life. And so you get this idea that black people are less valiant, and then you get the church president, Wolford Woodruff, who says, I don't know about less valiant, but they certainly were sitting on this proverbial fence in the pre-mortal life. They weren't sure who to follow. So you get these two competing uh, theories about black people. Um, they were less valiant, or they were sitting astride the fence, as President Woodruff said. And in the meantime, as the church went, uh, the pioneers went west, um, there were a lot of uh, black and biracial uh, Latter-day Saints who were, they wanted to get baptized and they wanted to serve missions and they wanted to get their patriarchal blessings. And so the church is really, really struggling um, in terms of how to identify them. Are they, if they're, if they're light-skinned, but they have a black African ancestor, does that mean they're cursed? And so they decide to follow what's called the one drop rule. And, and this kind by, of mirrors U.S. law at the time, right? It does. So the one drop rule originates in the early 19th century when um, slave owners in the South try to figure out who's, who's Black and who's not, because they don't want interracial marriage and interracial sex. 
So um, the church picks up on this trope in the U.S. Census um, uh, states the one drop rule in 1930. So that if anybody has, uh, if any household has somebody with one drop African ancestry, they'll be deemed cursed or black. And the states though are different. Each state has its own designations, which makes this also convoluted. Like in your home state of North Carolina, it might've been 1 16th. Virginia might've been 1 32nd. Right. So the church buys the, the most draconian or they adopt the most draconian um, version, which is one drop. Okay. And that carries on well into David O. McKay's presidency, I believe, right? Well, it carries on up until the priesthood ban is lifted. Now, the problem is with the one drop is you can't determine, there are no scientific ways to test bloodlines, right? I think I read in your book, it's uh, J. Reuben Clark, right? Um, Who really uh, is trying to nail this down because I don't know, what is this, the the 1940s? It's uh, becoming apparent that this is gonna be a problem. Uh, uh, church expansion and things of that nature. And so I believe it was J. Reuben Clark, who's uh, meeting with scientists trying to determine how we, you know, uh, determine lineage through bloodlines. Yeah. So uh, J. Reuben Clark is one of a handful of apostles in the 20th century who they're worried about bringing the church abroad, especially in Brazil, because it's a biracial country. And in 1940, Reuben Clark gets up in a first presidency meeting, and he says, brethren, I don't have a good feeling about this going into Brazil. We're going to be baptizing people with the curse, and we'll be ordaining them to the priesthood with the curse, and we won't even know we're doing it. And is that, sorry to uh, interject, is that something, because I, I, I want to nail this down too, is at this time, not even baptism? to those of African descent, as they put it, um, or is so, it? Yeah, no, let's pause for a moment. Okay. So what, what, what our black brothers and sisters could do at this point, mid 20th century, we'll say, what could they do in the church? They could get baptized. There's no evidence that Joseph Smith or any of his successors in the presidency had ever denied a black person baptism. And by the late 19th century, the first presidency had allowed them to do limited temple rituals like baptisms for the dead, but they could not marry in the temple and they could not receive their endowment. And so um, depending on where you were too in the 20th century, some blacks could could serve in um, church callings that didn't require the priesthood. So there are plenty of stories told about black people being the the superintendent of the Sunday school. And there are stories told where they could go home teaching, but they, it was just pretty clear that they were just to sit and not do anything, not really say anything. Um, in some cases, they could give talks and firesides, and depending on who the church leader was, in some cases, they couldn't. They were not to give talks in church firesides. So there's a little unevenness. Right. But there was never a policy, like in some Protestant Christian churches in the 20th century, um, Latter-day Saints never had a policy that the blacks and whites, the, the pews were to be segregated. Mm. It was more uh, it was more de facto, meaning that, and I'll give you an, an, an example. In 1940, um, Ezra Taft Benson was in Washington, D.C. as a state president, so he wasn't called into the 12 yet. And he had an urgent question for the first presidency. So he wrote him a letter in Salt Lake. So this is President Benson, who's the state president in Washington, D.C. He wrote the first presidency in Salt Lake, and he said that there's a Black couple who's coming to church, and some of our white Latter-day say they're not happy with this Black couple. What would you have me do? And the first presidency, they wrote back this, this skittish letter. I mean, they were nervous. And they wrote back, and they said, um, well, see if you can kind of, if the black couple will be okay with just sitting in the back in the corner by themselves, and if the white Latter-day Saints would be okay with that. But, but Brother Benson, tread carefully and follow the spirit and what to do. Mm-hmm. And that coincides with another story of a uh, Len and Mary Hope, a black couple in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they were denied 
the white folk in their Cincinnati, Ohio branch didn't want them. And so uh, there's a general authority whom I greatly admire, a guy named Marion Hanks. He's been dead for probably 15 years now, but he was a member of the first quorum of the 70. And Hanks was a missionary at that time, and he used to bring them the sacrament. And I think the hopes were allowed to come to church maybe like once a month or something. But um, for the most part, Elder Hanks and his companion would bring the hopes, the sacrament, they would take their tithes, they were always faithful tithe payers. And of course, Elder Hanks, he was kind of a liberal, he didn't support the priesthood ban, as he got older, he was very vocal about it. And he always thought it was wrong to deny this good couple the right to worship. And but, but you know, I'm not defending it, of course, I'm not right. I'm just simply saying that this is 1930, right? And Latter white Latter-day Saints were they're like a lot of people. They just, they don't think highly of um, black folk. The, the, the larger racist society certainly permeates the church. Right. One of the, and I hope you can maybe set this up for me a little bit better, but one of the, uh, if we're moving along at the, the timeline, um, one of the uh, most, I guess, uh, groundbreaking uh, incidents that I, that I came across in your book was, um, Lowry Nelson and his exchange with the First Presidency. This is leading up to what's known as the First Presidency Statement, 1949, um, addressing the Blacks and the, and the priesthood and temple restriction situation. The first time we have a First Presidency address on it, and it's sort of a response to this exchange with Lowry Nelson, who uh, you may have to refresh my memory. I believe he's a sociologist at the time, Latter-day Saint sociologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Lowry Nelson, <laughs> he's an interesting character. I think he's one of the most fascinating characters in 20th century Mormonism. And that letter exchange with him is, if I mean, if you, you can look it up, it's uh, its excellent. I think it gives you a little idea of his, his character. <laughs> yeah, he, so I write about him extensively in this next book um, because he's he's the person that, that helps to codify the priesthood doctrine. So maybe that's a, this is a nice question. Unknowingly. For, yeah, yeah, so it's just a nice segue. Um, so, so just to back up, just to, to say something I think it's in, important to say, which is that by the first two decades of the 20th century, the um, Mormon racial, they're just a bunch of racial theories about black people. There's no hardened doctrine. Brigham Young, of course, denied black people the right to be baptized. But there was a lot of unevenness with that. And when Blacks received their patriarchal blessings, there was some weirdness with that. Some were told that they were cursed from Cain. Some were given the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is problematic because those are the blessings for people who are supposed to run the church. And Black people, of course, can't run the church. So there are lots of issues with, with um, Blacks and how they fit into the church. And it becomes particularly difficult when the church starts to expand into the 20th century. And Lowry Nelson um, is a uh, sociologist. He grew up in Farron, Utah. He is an expert on Cuba. And he taught at BYU in the 19, he went to BYU. And he also taught at BYU in the 1920s. He taught Ezra Taft Benson, for example, called uh, Brother Benson, one of his best students. He said, he got an A and an A minus in my classes is what he said later. Uh, but Larry Nelson taught at BYU for a while, and then he left because he just didn't fit into the, um, he, he was too unorthodox. He didn't know if there was a God, and he somehow shared that with a colleague who shared it with one of the brethren in Salt Lake. So if you're teaching at BYU and you're borderline atheist, probably not a good thing. And so this is that time. Yeah, right. He, he had some, some of, um, one of the apostles came to his aid. He's a good man, leave him alone and we're not gonna fire him. And another apostle said, he's gotta go. And so he did have allies, but he didn't wanna stay at BYU under that environment. So he resigned and he had taught for a short stint at Utah Agricultural College, which is now Utah State. And in um, the late 1940s, he taught at the University of Minnesota where he spent the rest of his career until he retired in the early 1970s. And when he was at the University of uh, Minnesota, a friend of his named Heber Meeks, an old boyhood friend from Farron, Utah, wrote him a letter. I was tempted to say email. 
he wrote him a letter and he said, um, dear Lowry, this is Heber. We haven't talked in a while. I am the president of the Southern States mission. And the brethren have given me the charge to explore the possibility of opening up a mission in Cuba over which I will preside. Since you are a recognized authority on Cuba and that you've been there many times over the years, can you give me some direction in terms of where should I, where I should proselytize my missionaries and where, where they should, or what areas they should avoid because of the curse? And Lowry Nelson, he writes back, I'm gonna be really, take my filter out for a moment, but he writes back, are you kidding me? You're gonna go into Cuba, this biracial country, and you're asking me to avoid certain pockets? That's just stupid. Why would you do that? And so, but Lowry Nelson, that's what he says to Hebrew Meeks, but uh, Lowry Nelson writes the brethren. And he says, what's going on here? You wanna go into Cuba? He said, uh, and so he, he questions the brethren and they write back and they said, dear, dear brother Nelson, we understand that you don't agree with the church's teachings on race, but they are ordained from the Lord. And uh, Lowry Nelson exchanges a handful of letters with them. And he basically, he chastises them for their racism. He said, you guys are so ethnocentric. It's disgusting. And um, the brother and responded back with dogma. We understand that people like you do not accept these doctrines, but the church does. And so they write this statement. It's a paragraph statement that's published in 1949 to Lowry Nelson. And it's never been published anywhere else. It's, I had a, someone from church headquarters write me up or call me, I guess, last year. And they wanted to know, we've been looking in the enzyme for this and or the improvement era and we couldn't find it. And I said, because it's not there. So it's a private letter in which uh, the brethren sign their names. Um, this would be uh, George, George Albert, Albert Smith, George Albert yeah. Smith J. Reuben Clark, and David O. McKay. And they call the priesthood restriction doctrine. This is the first time anywhere, at any place, at any time, uh, where the first prince calls it doctrine. And so apostles before that had called it theories. They, they looked for the revelation with Joseph Smith. They couldn't find it. They called it a policy. They're all over the place. But in 1949, that's the first time it's called doctrine. And uh, I'm giving a whole paper on this at the Mormon History Association conference in a month. So, um, so what happens is, is that uh, Lowry Nelson is not very happy about this. His church, he thinks is racist. It's how could you, we treat people this way. And Lowry Nelson writes a um, magazine article from, it's called The Nation. It's one of the most popular magazines in the United States at the time. And he basically calls attention to the church's race doctrine. And he brags later that this is the first time that anyone has ever exposed this heinous doctrine. So he's like patting himself on the back. That he proud of himself. <laughs> proud of himself. And it raised a ruckus both among the brethren and at BYU and a BYU religion professor named Roy Doxey, uh, complete lightweight. He, he doesn't have the erudition of uh, Hugh Nibley or uh, Sidney Sperry. I mean, he's a fundamentalist, he's anti-evolution. And uh, he writes, he writes uh, Lowry Nelson some private letters chastising him. And he also writes a letter to the nation setting the doctrine straight. And Nelson basically tells him he's an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about, you're an idiot. Anyway. So what happens is, is this is important maybe for your listeners to know, or you might find this interesting, is that there are a number of people at BYU, particularly in the religion department, other than Doxy, who do not support the race doctrine. They're not on board. Now they're not vocal about it. They value their employment. But Hugh Nibley would be one of them, does not support it. Um, a guy named, um, losing his name for a moment. But there's a number of people who don't support the race doctrine. And so the first presidency, they create a, they ask Hugh Nibley to create a new statement that they can convince his colleagues who don't support it. Can you write a statement, make it scholarly? That's what the BYU president asks him to do. This is the, the brother, what becomes the 1949 statement? Well, the 49 statement wasn't good enough. It wasn't convincing anybody. Oh, I see. Sorry, yeah, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the 49 statement, <laughs> 
gets circulated on the underground to all the faculty. And even uh, Spencer W. Kimball's son, Apostle Kimball, his, his son, Spencer LeBan Kimball, received a copy of it back in Michigan, where he's teaching uh, at a law school. So this is like underground stuff that's being circulated. Mm. And it's um, Juanita Brooks, the great Mormon historian. She said, when I received a copy, I stayed up till 1.30 in the morning reading it. And I was alternately snickering, giggling, and angry. <laughs> So this is like really interesting stuff because the Brethren's now going on record for the first time. And there's a whole number of people in the church education system at BYU Religion who don't support this stuff. And um, Hugh Nibley's one of them. So he turns Wilkinson down. He says, I'm not gonna do this. He said, jump, he basically says, typical Nibley, jump in the lake, I'm not gonna do this. And um, so uh, he, uh, Wilkinson asked another faculty member, a guy named David Yarn, who was the Dean of Religion at the time. And Yarn, for undisclosed reasons, turns him down. I think he knows it's controversial, right? Trying to convince colleagues, educated colleagues that the ban is, you know, that it's a good thing, right? And then um, in the meantime, J. Reuben Clark writes a statement that he wants to introduce in general conference. It goes above and beyond the 49 statement that Lowry Nelson had written. And I should add that the that Lowry Nelson statement um, was circulated uh, by the brethren as it, when someone asked him about the priesthood ban, you know, here, read this. So essentially they're, they're just taking part of the letter from Nelson and then putting it in a separate document and sending it out to people. That was going to be my question was if this was the equivalent, uh, the equivalent of a enzyme front page thing, or if this was a little bit more, I guess if they were a little bit more PR aware at this time. And so it's just sort of used well, authoritatively, but not broadcast. It is, it is used authoritatively, but uh, context is always important. This right. is the early 50s. So the civil rights movement is just slowly starting to take off. And the brethren aren't interested in circulating this, you know, promoting it in the enzyme or it's just, just on the underground. So if somebody asks about the priesthood ban, give them that 49 statement. If um, religion teachers at BYU, if your students ask, give them the 49 statement. Well, they realize the 49th statement is not doing what it's supposed to do. It's just basically dogma. And so J. Reuben Clark writes a statement after David Yarn and Hugh Nibley turned him down. And he writes a statement and he embellishes the 49th statement. And he says that he says something that's interesting. He says the church doesn't oppose civil rights. Because now people are starting to wonder, why does the church oppose civil rights? What does it have to do with the priesthood ban? And so President Clark is the first leader to go on record saying the church doesn't support, oppose civil rights. And he also acknowledges that there was a black man who was ordained to the priesthood. That's interesting, 1952. And he wants to deliver this in general conference. It goes through three drafts. And President McKay at the last minute says no. Let's not do it. Pulls the plug. So he never delivers this, this sermon for conference in which he adds on the 49 statement, promoting civil rights, acknowledging black men that held the priesthood. And President McKay pulled the plug because it was just simply too controversial. And McKay himself was not a favor of integration. And he just thought civil rights was so divisive in the church. And that was another problem. Let's just not talk about it. Let's just ignore it. And so that's where it sat for a long, long time, is that this 49 statement came out, they were circulating it in private, and it wasn't until 1969, um, we'll talk about this in a minute, I suppose, but it wasn't until 1969 where the first presidency will produce a second statement on the priesthood. Okay. 20 years apart, the two right. statements. I'm glad you brought up uh, David O. McKay, because I, I, I think he is often at least you know, it, from, from some of the more um, orthodox resources that I've looked over, he's often sort of left out of this whole story altogether. And I get the notion from your book that um, he's, he's way more important than I think we, we realize uh, in a lot of ways. One of the things that comes to mind is just unilaterally moving to uh, get rid of that one drop rule we talked about earlier that uh, is kind of interfering with his missionary expansion efforts and sort of his vision of, of where the church is, is, is headed. Um, 
so I was wondering if you could kind of talk about him a little bit and, and some, some of the things that are going on. I mean, he's complicated because while he is making some strides that I think were revolutionary at that time, he's still this fear of, of race, mix, race mixing is, is so prevalent and uh, is clearly on, on his mind a lot. He's, he's afraid of that. Yeah, so sometimes we like to think of President McKay as being racially progressive. He wasn't. And in the, I think that some of the people who, who've argued this, even some fellow scholars, um, it's because he didn't like the ban. And somehow they associate that with being, you know, progressive on the on the race issue. But he he was a he didn't support civil rights. And I don't know of any you can call anyone racially progressive who opposes civil rights. And a lot of it was for what you just said, um, Nick, that the brethren were afraid that if you got rid of these barriers that kept blacks over here and whites over here, whether it's an employment or a school or wherever, that somehow they'll mix and they'll ultimately date and marry. That's the fear. I suspect that if you could tell the brethren in 1950 or 55 or 1960 that we're going to promote legislation at both the state and federal level, uh, making it illegal to discriminate black, blacks in jobs and housing, and we can guarantee that blacks and whites won't marry, they probably wouldn't have cared. And, and interracial is marriage is driving all of their fears behind civil rights. That's yeah. That's that's what I was gonna say. I, I I think that that gets lost in all of this, and that was sort of a, to me, I think that's sort of um something that has to be has to be mentioned because it's at the, at the backs of everyone's minds who are who are making these decisions is this notion of um, race mixing, and it's and it's rooted directly in the the idea of the curse and, um, who is it? Uh, I don't want to backtrack, but uh, Marky Peterson, the 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 address, where. He effectively lays out what would happen, and and uh, it's very doomsday esque. But I think the notion is that you know if if uh, we start mingling with with black people and, and white people, that they will uh, you know they will reproduce, and the next thing you know, the priesthood is gone. We no longer have it, and uh, it's that address at maybe BYU or something like that that. Uh, um, seems to be fueling a lot of the a lot of the fear at this time. I think I think it's really important to understand something. We we like to to lump people in broad brushes, right? Right. All of the founding fathers were Christian or I've heard someone say they're all atheists. I mean, that's not how right. we work as humans, right? The answer is they were always nuanced and all of the brethren thought that black people were cursed and less valiant. That's not true. David O. McKay um we would call him, I guess, a moderate, and Spencer Kimball would be a moderate. That is, they believed that there was something about Abraham chapter two in the preexistence, but Kimball and Joseph, excuse me, Kimball and President McKay, they never said the black people were cursed. They didn't believe that. Then you've got the, the more, the hardliners, as I call them, which would be Joseph Fielding Smith, Elder McConkey, and Mark Peterson. And when Mark Peterson gave this, um, this address at BYU in the summer of 1954, this is just after the Brown versus the Education Board of Education at Topeka, Kansas Supreme Court decision, which struck down segregation in public schools. Mm. And Elder Peterson was just freaking out because he was afraid that it might affect, well, it would lead to interracial marriage. Right. But he said something that only a handful of hardliners would say, which is that uh, he said that that black people are basically only fit to be servants to white people, and he even mentioned in the next life. Now that's an old biblical trope from the 19th century that suggests that um, the way that some Southerners read the Bible that God had deemed black people to be in bondage to white people, both in this life and in the next life. So Mark Peterson is picking up on this trope. Joseph Fielding Smith had taught it. Joseph F. Smith had taught it. One can't imagine that David O. McKay or Spencer Kimball would ever say such a thing, right? So th there are gradations, and I'm sure we'll talk about Hugh Brown in a minute. Then we've got Hugh Brown who's in a league by it in his own, <laughs> right? Right. He doesn't think that, that Black people are cursed. He doesn't think that they're less valiant. He calls it a bunch of gobbledygook. Those are his words. <laughs> So you've got these three different gradations in the church hierarchy. 
And unfortunately, there were probably more of the hierarchy who were in the hardline camp. But definitely uh, President Kimball and or Elder Kimball at the time and President McKay did not, there's no evidence they thought that black people were cursed. And since you bring them up, I think I want to share this with you. I think you'll find this interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to grow the church internationally if you have this ban in place. For all the reasons we've been talking about, they can't determine who's got the curse, who's got the drop, as they call it. And they know they can't, which means they know that they're baptizing and conferring priesthood ordination unwittingly on people in Brazil or the Caribbean or wherever. And furthermore, it's really important that the restriction is based on lineage, not skin color. Now, to an outsider, that just sounds so bizarre, because if you have a dark-skinned Polynesian in Samoa, right, who can hold the priesthood, dark-skinned Polynesian in Samoa can hold the priesthood, then you get some blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned dude who can't hold the priesthood because it's rumored that somewhere in his family line, great-great-great-grandpa was from Africa. Right. And so, obviously, to a to the observing eye, that just seems so bizarre. The white dude, and then you've got the dark-skinned Polynesian. And um, I talked to a Black Latter-day Saint. He told me something interesting. And he, he, there's no question he's Black. He identifies as Black. He looks Black. And um, good guy. But one of the church patriarchs told him, they said, you can't have the priesthood because you live in the United States. But if you went over to the Caribbean, they'd give you the priesthood. Because... They give every dark-skinned person the priesthood over there. Right. And um, anyway, so the, there's this racial fluidity, and the Brotherhood are concerned about it. So President McKay, after World War II, uh, wants to grow the church. And the Brethren had been trying to grow the church a little bit into Brazil and South Africa before the war, but now they want to just take it off. Mm. And so they establish missions um, in Australia. They establish them in, of course, the Caribbean, all over the place, New Zealand, and they get missionaries writing in, dear President McKay, what, what do we do? How do we know? We were, we're, we're teaching this family. They look black. We're not sure. They don't know their ancestry. And then you get stuff like, what about um, people in the outback in Australia, the Bushmen? Are, are they cursed? I mean, they just don't know. Right. And so President McKay does something that that's never been talked about before, never been written about before. And he convenes a committee in 1954 to look into it. He had just, just returned. Uh, Banyan Committee? Called the Banyan Committee. And he had just returned from uh, South Africa in 1954. And I mentioned it a little bit in this, the book that you referred to on uh, the church and blacks, but I go into a lot more detail in the second book. And uh, so he, he gets back from South Africa and President McKay convenes a committee to look into the scriptural justification for the ban. And he stacks the deck, we would say, meaning that he doesn't put Joseph Fielding Smith on the committee. <laughs> he doesn't put Bruce McConkie on the committee, who at that point would have been a member of the first quorum of the 70. But he puts a guy named Adam Benyon on the committee, an apostle. He puts um, Spencer Kimball on the committee, this moderate. And the committee is, um, uh, they, they, they are heavily influenced by a guy named Lowell Benyon, who was a cousin to Apostle Benyon, and Lowell Benyon is good friends with President McKay. So they've stacked the committee, no question. I was going to say, just by the virtue of the people he's chosen, you're sort of given an indicator there where he's leaning at that point, right? <laughs> it is, yeah. So they stack the committee, and Lowell Benyon, let me say a word about him, he's, uh, he's probably the most popular institute teacher in the entire church. His, um, he, he mostly teaches at the University of Utah. And he's very liberal on the priesthood issue. He, he's been telling his students in a nice way. He's careful because he's very loyal to the church. But, but you know, this band's got to go. That's pretty much what he says in not so many words. And ultimately, that'll get him fired. 1962, he gets fired for teaching all of this stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, the most popular institute teacher in the entire church, and he, he ultimately gets fired. But in 1954, um, so eight years earlier, he's on this committee to look into the ban. And Benyon writes the report that his cousin, Apostle Benyon, will give to President McKay. 
And essentially, I'll just summarize at least two main principles from the report. The report says that there is no scriptural justification for the priesthood restriction. I mean, no surprise there, right? And number two, that people in the South and the church are basically, this is 1954, so circumstances are important. He said, people in the South and the church are racist. They're going to have a hard time lifting the ban. And so Spencer Kimball, um, who has a copy of the Benyon Report in his private papers, and I've had the great privilege to look through those, this is all top secret. And he has, he writes on a cover letter of the report. He says, to my family, all caps, please don't share with anyone. When I die, this is to go right to the first presidency. So, I mean, this is, they don't want this out. Right. And one of the reasons why they don't want this out, it's not so much that some of the apostles or some of the leaders don't support the ban. They acknowledge that there's no revelation, none. They had been given carte blanche to all the first presidency minutes from the since the 19th century. And there was no revelation, none. But yes, yeah, a revelation instituting it to establish the ban. Yeah. Right. So President Smith, who is the church's most adept doctrinal expositor, being the senior apostle that he is at this point, and also the church historian, he'd been saying for decades the ban began with Joseph Smith. And basically, in a, in a very subtle way, they're saying there's no evidence for that. There's not. We've looked everywhere in the many minutes. There's no evidence. And so uh, Elder Kimball doesn't want this out. Give it to the first presidency. He tells his family. And President McKay, um, he wants to lift the ban for the good of the church. But he can't because there are too many uh, opposing voices in the 12. And that's why. And just to give you uh, an illustration of the opposing voices in the 12, um, Hubie Brown, who was called in as an assistant member to the 12 in 1953, and then by 1958, they would elevate him to the quorum of the 12, when he's much, he's, he's really during his advanced age, he came into the church leadership late in life. Um, so 1953, the assistant to the 12, 1958, he comes in as a member of the 12. He had, he was first proposed for the 12 in 1940, some 18 years earlier. And the reason why his family tells this story, this is family story. They say that, that, um, that Elder Brown or Hubie Brown was proposed at least like eight or nine times for the 12 over the years, the openings. But yet they, pro Joseph Fielding Smith and his allies protested his coming into the quorum every time because it was known that uh, Elder Brown did not support the the priesthood restriction. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and then when he finally got in 1958, and then he was called into the first presidency a couple of years later, that posed a lot of problems because he elevated to the highest quorums of church leadership, just like that. And they all knew where he stood on the priesthood ban. And they were, quite frankly, they were mad at President McKay. And the reason why he got in in 1958, after being denied for the previous 18 years, is because President McKay made a unilateral decision. He didn't consult the 12. And that happens. It, it doesn't happen that that's very a, often. That's a pattern. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often, but yeah, President McKay was, he was like Gordon Hinckley in many ways. He was a maverick. Right. They, um, there are some church presidents that do their darndest to consult with the 12 and their counselors, but President McKay and President Hinckley were known to be mavericks and they would just sort of do their own thing and let the consequences follow. Right. But anyway, um, so with President McKay, um, he, does, he can't lift the ban in 1954, even though he knows it's hurting the church because there's just not enough support for it. And President McKay believes that the, the, um, that the priesthood ban is a policy not a doctrine. Yeah, I was going to say, can you talk about uh, sort of that distinction? It's it's significant in uh, LDS thought. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the, the distinction between a, a doctrine and a policy. Yeah. So, so we have to go back just for a quick moment. Recall the 1949 letter that the first presidency sends to Lowry Nelson, which they call it doctrine. And I just said that McKay, who's now the church president, calls it a policy. That seems like a contradiction, right? Right. And Reuben Clark wrote that letter to Lowry Nelson. McKay did not believe that it was doctrine, but he assigned his name to be a good 
counselor. Company man. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. He doesn't believe it, but he signs his name. Like, ah, whatever. Right. But he, um, there's plenty of evidence that he suggests that it's a policy. And the difference between a policy and a doctrine is that a policy can be changed by a unilateral decree from the church president, right? It's a policy. But if it's elevated to doctrine, it requires something far more significant to alter, like a revelation. And that's really the, the main distinction that, um, and I want to just pause for a moment and explain what a revelation is in the church, because I think there's lots of mistaken ideas about what a revelation right. is. Um, a revelation is when there's an idea that the brethren have, and they talk about it, they discuss it, they debate it. Sometimes they get angry because their views aren't being heard. They pray about it, repeat and rinse, talk about it, pray about it, fight over it. And then when they come to a conclusion about, they reach a consensus, which is what the Doctrine right, and Covenants right. talks about. When they reach that consensus um, with the church president's support, of course, that's what, where it gets elevated to a doctrinal level. There are no supernatural visions occurring to them. And, you know, this is, it's a very mundane thing, really, in many ways. And um, I'm, I'm getting my information from Elder Maxwell talks about this, late Neil Maxwell. Right, Hubie right. Brown talks about this revelation. So it's very practical. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I, you, you hear, you, you do hear some of these candid, um, almost, you know, almost pulling the curtain back a little bit from time to time. I can recall Henry B. Eyring most recently um, when, uh, I think it was when President Monson was called as president, saying something to that effect that, this is what constitutes a revelation to us when we are all debating, and then and then we reach a unanimous decision. Sometimes the brethren don't. Uh, well, they don't win their way. Boyd Packer, for example, was known to withdraw from voting when he didn't get his way. <laughs> and you know, is it still a revelation if somebody votes or abstains from voting so that it can be unanimous? I guess your listeners can decide that. But sometimes that would happen right. because they they have strong opinions, right? They come from different walks of life. They have different personalities. And then sometimes they don't always get their way. And it's the way it goes in a large organization. And we're, we're starting now to get to a point where, um, and, and you mentioned Hubie Brown. I'd like to go into him a little bit more. But I want to um, point out at this time in the timeline, my understanding is at least uh, we've got sort of some power vacuums starting to open up. President McKay's um, feeble and, and um, I don't know if I should go so far as to say mentally uh, impaired, but, but I, I think it's no secret that uh, towards the end of his, his presidency, he ha had moments of lucidity, but then not so much. Um, and that's sort of what uh, brings Hubie Brown to the forefront. And, and then there's some uh, butting of heads. I can think of him and President Lee in particular, or not President Lee, but Harold D. Lee. And uh, this is all sort of culminating with the civil rights movement at that time. Am I right on that? Yeah, yeah. So, so President, um, the, the brethren have an awareness that the priesthood ban is, is problematic. And some of your older listeners may be familiar with, um, let me get it for you. Yeah. Um, where is it? Oh, I don't know. I thought it was behind me, but on my bookshelf. Anyway, it's a four volume series on messages to the first presidency. And it was first, um, it was put together by a guy named James R. Clark, religion professor at BYU, relative of J. Reuben Clark. And it's four volumes and it, it was, he started publishing it. First volume was in the early 60s and the last volume was in 1975. And he had to get permission from the brethren to publish these first presidency statements. And what was interesting is he wanted to publish the 1949 First Presidency Statement, in which case this would be the first time it would be out in the open to the church. And Joseph Fielding Smith, of all people, said, no, let's not do that one. Mm. And he, there's a few others he didn't want done either. So by this time, there's already sort of an, a tacit acknowledgement that it's... It's controversial. Controversial, yeah. Yeah, especially when um, Mormon politicians are running for office like George Romney. Oh, right. And right. Um, in Ezra Taft Benson's flirting with a presidential run um, in the 1960s. So there's a lot of 
there's a lot of uh, a big spotlight on Mormon racial teachings. I was going to say, does this sort of mark a time? Because I, I notice a, just a shift in the in the approach and the language from uh, almost just a little bit more PR aware um, in in through the through the '60s than what we see in the in the '40s and even the '50s, where uh, you know uh, Marky Peterson feels he can say that the sorts of things that he's saying that are quite controversial, but um, I wonder, is this shift towards a more um, uh, uh, PR approach? Is, is that is that sort of a result of of the politics of George Absolutely. Romney? Okay, Ab absolutely, and not just Romney. Romney is a big part, but not just Romney. 1968, April of 1968, the first presidency, they have a, a meeting, and at this time, uh, David O was still the president. President McKay, Hugh Brown, Hugh Brown's relative, guy named N. Eldon Tanner. Um, Alvin Dyer was a counselor, and then Joseph Fielding Smith. So there were five people in the first presidency, and it doesn't happen very often. To have, right. Mostly it's just the two counselors and the president. But anyway, um, in 1968, they had this, this meeting, and Hugh Brown says, nobody understands our position with the restriction that, you know, Black people are cursed, that they were less valiant. Nobody understands that. Why are we even trying to explain that to a reporter? Let's just make a new policy and keep our expressions about the Negro, quote, clear, positive, and brief. So focus on all the things that, that a black person or a Negro, as they said in those days, focus on all the things they can do in the church, not why we restrict them or exclude them. Right. And so that was a direct result of the criticisms of the civil rights movement. And, um, but go back just before that though, when Hubie Brown uh, came into the church leadership, a member of the Council of the Twelve in 1958, and then in 1961, he was appointed to the First Presidency, there was a lot of bitter feelings. Because the church is, it's one of those things that um, you put in your time, your dues, right? And here's this young whippersnapper, actually he's not very young, but here's this- this <laughs> Old whippersnapper. <laughs> this old whippersnapper <laughs> who's being elevated into the highest quorums and Joseph Fielding Smith and some others are not very happy about it. And because of that, and also his views on race. And Hugh Brown was born in Salt Lake City, the, the territories as they called them in those days. But he spent most of his formative years in Canada. He was not a good old Wasatch front boy. Right. He didn't didn't share their views of politics. He anyway. Um, so Hubie Brown, um, he did everything he could to lift the ban, and President McKay oh got so angry with him, which is ironic because you called him in, President McKay. <laughs> But he would pester President McKay to lift the ban. And um, in 1962, in March of 1962, uh, Hugh Brown had a meeting with Lowell Benyon. So Benyon would always go to, to concerns about the priesthood ban with Brown because they were like-minded spirits. They were kindred souls. So Benyon meets with President Brown at church headquarters. And President Brown says, Brother Benyon, you make sure you watch conference very closely. This is conference coming up in April, because you're going to be you're going to be happy. So he's he's predicting that the ban will be lifted in April of 1962. What is this based off? Uh, is this wishful thinking? Is this based on his own? Um, is he hedging his bets on something? So <laughs> by this point, the church decides to try an experiment, which is: can we go into a black African nation? and established the church with white missionaries from Salt Lake. That's what they're trying to do. Because remember, the brethren have this injunction that they're to preach the gospel to every kindred nation, tongue, and people. And there was never a footnote that said, except black African nation. So they really felt you know, compelled by the scriptures to bring the gospel to every kindred nation, tongue, and people. And how do you do that when a third of the world is shut off because of this odious ban? And so, they get word that there are some people from Nigeria who they've been asking since the late 1940s about the church. They'd come across some church literature. They, for a lot of different reasons, they'd read the Book of Mormon, some of them, and some of them had visions that they, they claimed to have. And so they wanted the church. And in 1949, when they first made the overture, the church, the brethren just blew them off. Because again, they didn't know what to do. They just kind of blew them off. Well, by the early 1960s, after they had been bombarding Salt Lake City and church headquarters with letters. They 
We can't put them off any longer. So they try this experiment. Let's send missionaries, white missionaries, to run these African churches in Nigeria. And uh, Brown seizes the moment. This is the time. We've got to lift the ban. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but I will sure. just, because my book does this. But, but he, he tries, you know, let's give him the Melchizedek priesthood. And of course, no. And then he, he tries to do something kind of more sinister. <laughs> let's give him the erotic priesthood. And, and Brown's no dummy. He knows if you give him the erotic priesthood first, that will ultimately lead to the Melchizedek priesthood. Right. And they consider it. They talk about it. And um, it's, it's that context in March of 1962, as they're starting to missionize in Nigeria, where he tells Benyon that we're going to give him the priesthood. Now, it doesn't happen because Joseph Fielding Smith won't support it. Yeah. But, but keep in mind, once again, what this looks like. President McKay thinks it's a policy. And he can lift the policy. The hardliners in the 12, like Elder Smith, President Smith, and Harold B. Lee, and those guys... They think it's a, it's a doctrine, and it can only be removed by revelation. And what does that look like? The entire 12 have to agree to it. And we don't agree to it, Mr. President. Mm. So that, those are the politics at stake, that, they, that one side thinks it requires a revelation because it's doctrine, and the other side suggests that it's a policy that could be lifted at the president's wishes. Right. And Hugh Brown, of course, is the latter. He thinks the president can just lift it unilaterally. Is, and is it true... Um... I feel like I've heard you mention that it, uh, we even got to a point where President McKay was planning to ordain um, a black man to the priesthood at some point, and it was sort of uh, nixed, I guess, at the at the last minute. But he had actually come to that decision. Yeah. So again, let's go back to some context now. So we've got yeah. the civil rights movement going on in the 1960s. And the brethren are taking on heat from a lot of different quarters, both in the church and without. And by 1968, two things happened. It's kind of a weird how these things seem to play out in history. But April of 1968 is a pivotal month and year for the brethren. Two things happened that really just pushes President Brown into action. The first one is that um, it's the first... Uh, protest at a university that BYU will experience. The University of Texas El Paso decides to boycott a track meet at BYU because of the church's priesthood policy. And of course, it makes national news. This is April of 68. And then after that first boycott, dozens of other schools will mm -hmm. protest. The New York Times, the Washington Post, they're all covering it. And the brethren are just beside themselves because of the terrible exposure to Mormon racial teachings. The second thing that happens in April of 1968 is that Ernest Wilkinson, the BYU president, receives a letter from the Department of Justice. We're coming after you. We're going to figure out why you don't have blacks at your school. And uh, Ernest Wilkinson's a lawyer. This is under president. Who's the president at this time? McKay. 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 Okay. McKay will die in um, January of 1970. Okay. So two years before he's dead, these two pivotal events occur. The first protest occurs in April of 68. And then a week later, Wilkinson gets notice that the feds are coming after him to investigate um, why they don't have African-Americans on campus. And so I go through all this in great detail. It's really a fascinating thing about, you know, trying to uphold the, the federal law but also to answer to the board who don't, do not want black kids at BYU because of interracial marriage. So Wilkinson's torn in both directions from the board for whom he answers and then the civil rights investigators. Right, and he's right. a lawyer. So he knows that the civil rights people could shut down BYU if they want to. And how, how would they do that? Just briefly, um, they threaten Wilkinson. They say, look, we're gonna take away your federal Pell Grants and a number of your students have them. We won't give any more research funds to your faculty. We won't, um, we're not the accrediting body, but we can put pressure on the accrediting body to make sure you're, you're not accredited. Mm. So that's the kind of stuff they're doing. And, um, and the short story is it ultimately leads the board to start recruiting blacks in some black faculty. They're forced to, they don't do it willingly. And, um, 
So by September of 1969, let's, let's go there now for a quick moment. So by September of 1969, when the federal civil rights investigation at BYU was going on, and also the protests are now swelled to Arizona, Washington, Wyoming, Colorado, they're all over the place. Brown meets in private with uh, Marion Hanks, who's of the 70, Lowell Benyon, um, Sterling McMurrin, who's a philosopher at the University of Utah, who doesn't support the priesthood ban, and also a guy named Obert C. Tanner, who's um, also teaches philosophy at the University of Utah, but he's a wealthy uh, financier in Utah, he's the jewelry business. So he meets with these four liberals and Brown, uh, they meet at the Hotel Utah. And Brown, uh, I don't have a, we don't have a record of the transcript. I wish I did. <laughs> but, but we know they talk about the priesthood ban. And um, so Brown, after that meeting, he goes to President McKay's sons, Lawrence and Llewellyn McKay. And he says, um, he says, your father is getting older and he's going to die soon. Help me to convince him to lift the ban before he dies. Because if he doesn't lift the ban, his successor won't do it, nor will his successor's successor. And he's talking about Joseph Fielding Smith and then Harold Lee. Mm. They won't lift the ban. So your father has to do it. So in September of 1969, President McKay and, uh, excuse me, President Brown and the two sons meet with President McKay in the Hotel Utah, where the church president is basically at the last legs of his life. He's not even coming into the church office. And Spencer Kimball wrote in his diary that the president was senile and out of it. Mm -hmm. So that tells you something. But anyway, um, they convinced President McKay to ordain a faithful uh, Black Latter-day Saint named Monroe Fleming. And Monroe Fleming had worked or did at the time, he worked at the Hotel Utah as a doorman. And he frequently spoke to missionary groups. He would bear his testimony. He was very loyal to the church. He had a strong testimony. So they wanted to reward him. Let's ordain him to the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, notice what I didn't say. Let's give everybody the priesthood. Right. They, all they said was, let's ordain this faithful, loyal brother. Now, I, I, I interpret that to mean that that's the first crack of the door, right? That's my, you know, my inference. And knowing Brown, I'm sure he didn't intend that to be a, a one-off. It sounds like a foot in the door. No, that's, that's, let's just start the door open and then blow it wide open for the brethren who you know, can pass the worthiness interview and all of that. So anyway, McKay says, okay. There was a moment of lucidity where he said, okay, we'll do it. And in the meantime, Alvin Dyer, who was in the first presidency, uh, got wind of it. And he contacted Harold B. Lee, who was by far and away the most influential um, church leader at this time. Joseph Fielding Smith was in his 90s, and he was basically sleeping through half the meetings. I mean, I'm not making this up. There are stuff that president smith is at the meeting and he's sleeping again you know mm -hmm. so yeah. just his advanced age and so harold lee was the guy in charge he was by far the most powerful apostle and his fellow members of the 12 also recognized his influence marion romney is a, an apostle and he, he says that my 20 years in the quorum harold lee was it he was the mm -hmm. guy anyway so harold lee um was a young man in the fall of 1969 and he wasn't the most senior apostle, that was Joseph Fielding Smith. But given President Smith's age, everybody knew that this youthful and vigorous Lee, who was in his early 70s, would soon be the church president. And they anticipated- and potentially for, for a good amount of time. Right, right. Because President McKay was the church president for some 20 years. Right. And they everybody thought that uh, he would follow President McKay, start in his 70s and go all the way into his 90s. And- um, your listeners who don't know LDS church history didn't happen that way. Lee died after, you know, a short period in office from an unexpected illness. But that was the thought that he would be the church president for a long time. He just had to bide his time until President Smith died. Well, anyway, uh, Alvin Dyer got word that they were going to ordain Monroe Fleming. And Dyer told Lee, you've got to come back. He's on a church assignment. You've got to come back. This is what he's going to do. And Lee came back and he was furious. And he went around and he talked to each of the apostles that Brown had talked to, including a Spencer Kimball. And uh, Spencer Kimball had showed up in President 
Brown's office after Lee had talked to him, he said, President Brown, I'm so sorry. I have to change my support. I, I have to withhold it. I fear Brother Lee. And what he meant by that was he's a powerful apostle and I'm going to be president of the 12 soon enough. I can't cross him and he'll be the church president. Right. So he's crying and sobbing. President Kimball is an emotional man. And uh, he's sobbing as he tells President Brown this. And Brown starts to sob. He's just devastated. Because keep in mind that he knows that if the ban is not lifted with President McKay, it won't be lifted anytime soon. It's looking like it's here to stay for a while. Yeah. So it's in the midst of, of that chaos in which President McKay backs off. And Brown says, do it anyway. And McKay tells President Brown, he said, I don't have the energy to fight them. I'm not going to do it. Let somebody else worry about it. And that's how, that's what happens with President McKay. He just doesn't want to fight him. And I'll, I'll end the story here. So this is September of 1969. Um, President Brown attempts to lift the banner thwarted. And then December of 1969, um, something happens that really puts the church's race teachings under a microscope. Um, during the athletic riots, Brown called Stanford University, who was protesting BYU, and he told their president, we're going to lift the ban. And it makes the news. This is not the first time that Brown's talked to the media about this. He did it in 1963, too. We haven't even talked about that. Um, but he tells them in, in 19, November 1969, he tells Stanford president, we're going to lift the ban, so you guys won't have to protest us anymore. And that makes the news. And, of course, Mormons are what is going on? Here's the first presidency counselor who's beloved in the church. He's well-respected. And he's telling the media that we're going to lift the ban. Huh? And so... Can you imagine this kind of thing going on today? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And Brown's doing this on purpose, right? Right. He's trying to put external pressure. And... It's a strategy. It's a huge strategy. It's not the first time that activists in the church have tried this. And anyway, so in uh, with all of that hoopla in the news... Harold Lee is just beside himself. He's got this wicked temper. And he calls a meeting and he says, we're going to write a new statement reaffirming our support for the priesthood ban. And it will go out as a first presidency statement. Mm. Now, McKay's name. Well, he's too sick. He actually mm. doesn't sign it. But Brown and N.L. and Tanner sign it, mm. representing President McKay. And Brown, of course... <laughs> doesn't want to sign this because he doesn't believe in it. And so when he reads the statement, he, uh, I'm not going to sign this. And um, they compromise and Brown reluctantly agrees to sign it if they add a statement about civil rights in it. And that's, they do that at Brown's uh, request. Approving of it. Yeah. So, but he sobs like a baby um, as he wrote in his diary. I sob like a child or baby when I signed this, because he didn't, he didn't support it. And, and then I'll end the story here. Um, President McKay died in January of 1970. And of course, according to the church's custom, the first presidency is dissolved and the members of the, the counselors go back into the 12 in their place of seniority. And Harold Lee, who was really the spokesperson for Joseph Fielding Smith, he told Brown, he said, you're done. We're not going to call you back in to the first presidency. This doesn't happen very often in church right. history, very rarely. But um, so they, they drop him from the first presidency, and, and Brown is absolutely crushed. And they drop him for one reason only, because of his, his activism against the priesthood ban. Obviously, we've got no, no movement, really, I guess, from, from the time that President uh, Smith is called as church president on to President Lee. And as you alluded to uh, earlier, he doesn't serve for for as long as everyone anticipates so then we're at president Kemble. i i know that i know there's a lot at play um but one of the things that stood out to me was just uh because we've kind of we've kind of mapped this along um the progress and and so one of the things that i notice um that seems to have a very moderating effect um on president Kemble is the scholarship that that is starting to be done um, I'm thinking of uh, Lester Bush in particular, and then and then Taggart. Um, but we get an indicator, right, that the scholarship that they're doing and that they're publishing really tips tips the scales for at least for for President Kimball at that time, right? 
Well, there's some interesting um, commentary on that. Um, so let me let me just back up if I can for a minute and talk oh, yeah, about yeah. what Pastor Bush is. Yeah, I think it's good to have context. Um, so President Kimball, when he became the, the prophet or the president in 1973, um, this is a statement I often make to Latter-day Saints to kind of, wow, and which is that President Kimball is going to lift the ban the minute he became the church president. That's a statement where I hear a pin drop in the room because that's obviously not the, the line that you read in a manual, right? The prevailing thought, right? Prevailing thought. But of course, I make that determination based on several different um, things, one of which is this diary that I've thoroughly reviewed. Two, he is, uh, President Kimball's a loyal, he's not Hugh Brown, he's, he's not a guy to push the boundaries, but he doesn't believe that Black people are cursed. And as he's visited or as he's attended or visited state conferences, especially in, in uh, South America and Brazil, he'd, he'd have these black people who would approach him, these black Brazilians, and they would say, oh, we, we're, we pay our tithing, black men, we pay our tithing and we're just, we want to go on a mission, we want to marry in the temple, and I, we, we just, we love the church. And oh my goodness, President Kimball agonized over that, just agonized over it. So it's human dimensions that just pull at his heartstrings. And in 1963, he told his son in a private letter, he said, the ban may, quote, be a possible error. Now, this is private. He would never say this in public. And then fast forward to the fall of 1969, when Hugh Brown spoke to him, and he said, okay, I'll, I'll support you, right? So, so we kind of have him on record already in, in 69 as supporting it, it being lifted, so... Yeah, so he's got, there's a lot going on, yeah. And this is, these are things that I develop at length in my next book that I'm doing. Um, so he, he becomes a president in 1973. Why in the heck does it take until 1978? That's the million dollar question, right? Right. If it's true, Matt Harris, what you're telling me, why does it take five years? And the answer is President Kimball has the same challenges that President McKay had. He's got, he's got doctrinal hardliners. And by this point, the, the most significant voice, the most impactful voice in the 12 is Bruce McConkie, who was called into the 12 in the early 1970s. Now, Joseph Fielding Smith is dead, who was a significant voice, and Harold Lee's dead, who was a significant voice, but he still has Mark Peterson. He still has Bruce McConkie. He still has Ezra Taft Benson. He still has Delbert Stapley. So these, these, these men, these apostles who have these strong views and uh, so President Kimball has to figure out a way to win them over. And I write a, a lengthy chapter in this next book talking about all the various ways that President Kimball strategizes to win them over. And the Brazil Temple is part of it. Yeah, I was going to say, I was, gonna, I was hoping you'd go into that, the Brazil Temple. Yeah, so the temple is not President Kimball's idea. It was already in motion at that point. Uh, Harold Lee, that was one of the things he did during his presidency, was called for the building of this Brazilian temple, which to me, as a scholar reviewing this stuff, I just, you know, kind of shake my head thinking that how could you build a temple and keep this ban? Because you're right. Of all the countries of the world that have biracial blood, it's Brazil, right? And just for your listeners back home, a little history lesson for a quick moment, is that Brazil was the last country in the Western world to abolish slavery. Mm. And it wasn't until 1888, some two and a half decades after the American Civil War. So, and of course, in this country, the 13th Amendment in 1865 ended slavery for good in this country. But it wasn't until 1888 where Brazil got rid of this. So people had been mixing and marrying in Brazil for centuries. Right. And I'm sure, I'm sure I, I know that President Lee would have known this. So, but... You know, he was set in his ways and not sure how he thought they could screen people from coming into the temple because J. Reuben Clark had worried this very precise thing in 1940. We have him on record. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but President Kimball recognizes that this temple in Brazil is a perfect bull, uh, bulwark to win some of the brethren over. And so uh, he goes to Elder McConkie first and he says, I love what he says. Elder McConkie, you know, we have this new temple and we've, we've got a problem. I mean, you know, it's, they've got Negroid blood there and, you know, what do we do? 
I mean, you know, <laughs> it's typical Spencer Kimball. What do we do? I mean, he knows darn well what to do. He wants to win McConkie over to become part of the solution. And Elder McConkie, to his credit, he's a huge hardliner. I mean, my goodness. He's as big as they come in terms of his views about blacks and curses and all that stuff. But Elder McConkie recognizes that the church cannot grow unless we expand into Brazil. And moreover, McConkie puts a theological spin to it, which is that uh, Jesus' second coming cannot occur until the gospel is taken into black nations. Mm. So he's, he, 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 makes a, he creates this end times theology behind it. Kimball had never made that claim, right. but Elder McConkie is doing it. So in some and ways, can be seen as fulfillment then. Yeah. And also, I don't want to get into the theological weeds, but right. um, Latter-day Saints are are um, interested in lineage. I don't know of any other Christian religion in the world that focuses on lineage like, like Latter-day Saints do. And um, what I mean by that, of course, is God's covenant has been extended to Latter-day Saints through the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And we don't, in the church, they don't focus on um, lineage as much as they once did, at least in my opinion. And I'd be happy to be proven wrong on this, but lineage was huge in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And so you would get uh, the brethren would, would give write books and sermonize and conference. You'd get institute teachers talking about it, which is that each lineage had a responsibility. So if you were from Ephraim, that meant you had the responsibility to run the church. Mm-hmm. And they even went so far as to talk about where Ephraim's descendants hail from, which is Northern Europe. So this is where the controversial comes from, right? White people, Northern Europe, run the church. And then, of course, Black people are cursed, considered cursed, and so they're outside of the house of Israel. They're not even part of the the tribe. And so the church had been, well into the early 1970s, the church had said that Black people cannot be adopted into the house of Israel. It's not the doctrine of the church. Because if you could adopt them in, and you could be pronounced the lineage of Ephraim, and along with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that meant that you were receiving temple and priesthood blessings. Does that make sense? Right. So obviously, Black people can't receive temple and priesthood blessings. And so we can't, you know, you can't be adopted in. Well, in 1977, uh, President Kimball says, all right, Elder McConkie, um, let's figure out a theology to justify the ban. And I'm so pleased that you're supportive of this, that you realize that we have to bring the gospel to every kindred nation, tongue, and people. So, so grateful for that. And I, I can't underestimate how, what a relief President Kimball felt when he brought the church's most significant voice on board. I mean, it was a major coup for President Kimball. And he, he said at one point, I felt like the earth, the moon, and the stars had been lifted from my shoulders when I won Elder McConkie over. Because he kind of thought that the other people would be sort of lightweight. I, nah, I, lightweight's a strong word. Um, they wouldn't be as nearly as challenging as Elder McConkie. So anyway, Elder McConkie, uh, let's figure out how to do this theologically. And Elder McConkie writes him a private memo. And he says to President Kimball, we can adopt them into the House of Israel. And so that's, that's what happens. Um, the church policy changes just like that. President Kimball's the church president. He's not beholden to the policies of other church presidents who, who said you couldn't be adopted in. Uh, McConkie's saying that now you can be adopted into the House of Israel. And of course, again, what that means is you're cursed, you're outside of the house of Israel, now you'll be adopted in and enjoy all the privileges and blessings as the lineage of Ephraim or Judah or whichever. So anyway, um, over the next uh, couple of years, uh, President Kimball meets in the 12 collectively with them and he tells them we've got to lift the ban. And he gets gets serious pushback. They're not interested, at least a number of them aren't. Mm -hmm. And President Kimball does... um, he meets in private with them too. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant, in my opinion, a brilliant exercise in organizational leadership. He meets collectively and individually. He's working with them, hearing their concerns. And one of his, um, his chief points is the Brazil temple. He said, brother, what do you expect us to do? We've got this temple. Right. And, um, and he's, Kimball was so confident, uh, or maybe you just say he was moved on by the spirit. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. But he was so confident that, that the ban would be lifted that when they laid the cornerstone um, in 1977 at the Brazil Temple, so this is just the, the ceremonial cornerstone, 
there was a faithful black Brazilian there who had been in the church since 1972. He was sort of middle class. He wasn't rich. He wasn't poor. Uh, but he was a faithful Latter-day Saint. His name is Savecchio Martins. And Kimball tells him at this cornerstone a ceremony, he, um, he calls him up and he says, uh, be prepared, be faithful, be loyal, be prepared. So he's, he's, he's giving him a foreshadow. This band's going to be lifted. Right. And this, right. Is, this is the spring of 1977. So we're still well over a year out. And so um, James E. Faust, who would later be called into the 12, was there and heard it all. And this is what's going on. Kimball is really going into overdrive in 77 and into 78. And he's got a few holdouts in the 12 he has to convince. And, um, and ultimately, he does it. So I'll say uh, one other thing that you might find interesting. I'm going to speculate for a quick moment. but Feel free. <laughs> yeah. I've speculated with President Kimball's son, um, who was a great, great scholar and wrote a number of books on church history that are really worth reading, including one of his father. I think um, Ed Kimball, who taught law at BYU for a number of years, he wrote probably the best book that Desert Book has ever published, the best biography mm. of his father. Very candid, very open, very loving. It's just a um, really good book. Anyway, Ed Kimball got, got access uh, to his father's papers for me. And, um, and I've shared all of these ideas with him before he passed. He died a few years ago. And he, uh, I, I told him one day something funny. I said, um, I said, your father, when he had the priesthood revelation in the temple, it wasn't by coincidence that Elder Peterson and Elder Stapley weren't there. And he started laughing at Kimball. Uh, Elder Peterson didn't support the band, didn't support lifting it. So but what a better way to do it than to have him out of the country in South America on a mission assignment. Right. Elder Stapley, I don't know about, um, he was in the hospital sick. Mm -hmm. And in June of 19, June 2nd, 1978, he was sick in the hospital and he would eventually die two months later in August. But there's no question that Mark Peterson was not there by design because he never, there's no evidence that he supported lifting the band. And when the revelation occurred, when they talked about it and they felt, you know, the spirit overwhelming them that this is the thing they ought to do, um, they called Elder Peterson um, a week later, I think is what it was. And they broke the news to him. And the first thing he said was, was well, did, did the majority, did the brethren all agree to it? President Kimball says, yep. Well, okay, I suppose I won't stand in the way. <laughs> and Elder Peterson was so insistent that even with the ban being lifted, that there ought to be a statement in the Deseret News, the church newspaper, um, prohibiting interracial marriage. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah, accompanying, accompanying it, right? Yeah, right, side by side, actually. When they announced the, the revelation, or they call it, it's called official, official manifesto number two. Yeah. So they published that in the Desert News, and then on the trifold right next to it, there was a statement that the church still discouraged interracial marriage. Mm, okay. So it kind of gives you an idea of where we're, where they were at at that time. On what basis? I'm sure that was. Um, on what basis? I guess are they are they still digging digging their heels in on on interracial marriage, but lifting this ban? Well. So uh, before it was quite clear before the ban was lifted why they opposed interracial marriage, right? Right. Because they couldn't they couldn't go to the priesthood. Their their posterity would be shut off from the blessings of the priesthood, right? And now that the the revelation's been lifted, Black Latter Day Saints are just they're flummoxed when they read this in the newspaper, and they're flummoxed because they're they're thinking, well, why does it matter now? Why does it matter? Why can't I go to the temple with whomever I want? Why does it matter? And the answer, of course, is the brethren still have some generational attitudes about race. Mm. This is born out of racism. That's really what it is. And, um, and it poses a hardship for um, Blacks in the church because we've got, I document a lot of this in my next book, but they go to their church leaders and they say, you know, you still tell us that we have to marry a Black person, right? There aren't any Black men in the church, one woman, Black woman writes. So what would you have me do? Marry a black outside of the church or marry a white man in the church. Your call. And so there's some tough counsel there, right? Yeah. There's no good answer. And so what happens is um, 
Boyd Packer is emphatic about no interracial marriages. He, I mean, he's absolutely emphatic. Marion Hanks is counseling anyone and everyone who hears his voice. Interracial marriage is a good thing. If you love each other and you're worthy, go to the temple. It'll break down barriers. So Elder Hanks is given the exact counsel, the opposite counsel from, excuse me, uh, Elder Packer. President Kimball is, is the interesting person here because he of all the leaders had been teaching against interracial marriage for a long time. And it's uh, just to be clear on this, President Kimball is following marital prescriptive literature from the 40s and 50s. And if you look at marriage manuals from the 40s and 50s, it says that the, the, the best and most harmonious marriages are ones that marry within one's religion, one's race, and one's socioeconomic background. And that's, that's kind of where President Kimball comes from. And that hasn't really changed since the revelation. And so the problem is, as I mentioned, you don't have enough black people in the church to marry each other. So a black woman goes to President Kimball. This is in 1978, just not too long after the revelation. And she goes to President Kimball and she said, they had an appointment, they met in his office. And she said, I've fallen in love with John Iyer, who was a white guy at BYU. She was a student and so was John. I've fallen in love with him. I know what the church teaches, my stake president, my bishop. I've talked to two apostles and two other members of the 70 and they all said, don't marry him. But I'm crushed, what do I do? And the church president who's very thoughtful he said, it's true that we counsel against interracial marriage because the most harmonious marriages are, as I mentioned. But he said, there was no doctrine to this effect. And if you love him and you feel like God is telling you to do it, you have my blessing. Mm -hmm. The woman just bursts out crying and he goes over there and gives her the biggest fatherly hug and tells her to be of good cheer. And that's how it was left. And she leaves his office after two apostles, two general authorities, Bishop and a stake president told her not to do it. The church president said, you've got my blessing. And so she walks out the door feeling like the bricks have been lifted from her shoulders. And that's, that's one of those things where I feel like, um, and maybe I'll just comment real quick here on just a, a trend that I see, this hesitation to um, publicly denounce past teachings, past doctrines, uh, whatever. Um, I'm sure it serves its purpose, but it... Uh, I think the the negative outweighs the the positive. Um, just speaking purely on on the the interracial marriage, uh, you know as well as I do, those teachings still show up in, in manuals. Have up until very recently, in the two thousands. I'm a I'm a young boy, um, and I I don't know how much of this is a byproduct of being raised in the South, and how much of this is you know other factors. But I I mean as a young kid, I'm hearing you know, this from, from my, from a friend of mine at church that his mom has, has told him, you know, interracial marriage is, is wrong. And it says so in the scriptures and you'll inherit a curse. And that's in, you know, the early 2000s. So I think even though maybe some of the, the attitudes have shifted and you've given a great example there of Kimball meeting in private with someone to counsel them privately, but this um, failure to get the church, I guess, up to, up to date, it has uh, repercussions. I guess, um, Nick, another way to look at this is why are admonitions against interracial marriage still in LDS manuals well into the 21st century, right? right. I would hope it's uh, just, in, just incompetence. <laughs> well, I mean, knowing what I know about how the church works and um, the church is like any large organization and it's run by a diverse group of people. And sometimes the people with the loudest voice in the meeting is the one that kind of rules the day. And, and um, depending on the topic and how passionately they feel about it. And you just learned a minute ago that not all of the leaders um, felt um, were in agreement that interracial marriage was good or bad, right? They have differences of opinion. And so why is it in the 21st century that these things are still there? There's a couple of reasons. One, there are people in church leadership who still believe it. And I can give you examples if you want. Elder Bednar was one of them, mm. uh, at least as of 
probably 10 years ago, he was preaching against interracial marriage, which is astonishing, right? Yeah. Because yeah. really, there's only one way to preach against it, just born out of racism. And that's not good. Um, the other one is, is that you look at the people who write the manuals. This is the Church Correlation Committee, made up of some general authorities, some BYU professors, some members of the um, church institutes. And the church has never denounced this idea. And therefore, when the people who put these manuals together, they think anything's free, fair game if it hasn't been denounced. So they can continue to put those admonitions against interracial marriage in those manuals because nobody's ever told them otherwise, right? Now, the race and priesthood document in 2013 says that interracial marriage is not a sin. That's the first time where we have a public denunciation of interracial marriage. But before that, you just got a patchwork and ad hoc um, uh, list of general authorities and church leaders saying, you know, yes, marry that person in this interracial marriage or, or no, don't do it. There was no policy. Right. And so people were just spouting off the church leaders and their teachings over the years that had never been retracted. That's the key word. A lot of this stuff continues to happen unless it's been retracted. And it's been retracted now. So if you go to church and someone says, oh, blacks and whites shouldn't marry, you can say, wait a minute. There's a document on the church's website that says that we don't believe that or teach that. So that's why these things continue to persist. And it wasn't until, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I think, someone shared this with me, that um, there was an old quote from President Kimball that had showed up in the Young Men and Young Women's Manuals up until, I think, two or three years ago. And the reason why it was removed, I'm, I'm sure of it, is because people complained. And, you know, the people in the correlation committee there, I'm sure they're good folk. I know some of them. And, um, but they just didn't, you know, they think that they're safe quoting church leaders. Mm -hmm. We just had a, last year, Elder Stevenson, Apostle Stevenson, made a, an admission that just blew my mind. He was speaking to the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, this Black Civil Rights Group. And of all places to, to do this, he did it, which is, I'm glad he did. But he, he stood up at the NAACP conference and he said, um, he denounced a recent manual. Uh, it was right. a quote that Joseph Fielding Smith had made into the manual. And of course, I'm sure these, these good black folk who were there in the audience that day are like, what's he talking about, right? They don't care about Mormon manuals. right? But it was a great form for Elder Stevenson to denounce this, this writing from the 1940s from a late apostle it was terribly offensive. And the fact that he did it in that form and the manner in which he did it, I think, was really speaks volumes about the brethren, I think, are trying to clean this, this stuff up. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a challenge because this, these teachings have been so deeply rooted um, in Mormon theology for so many years. And just because the revelation occurred in 1978, it doesn't mean that they, you know, just vanished overnight. Right. I did want to get your, you brought it up, but I, I, I did want to get your thoughts on the, uh, the gospel topics essay. Um, you know, whether or not you feel like it, it, uh, goes far enough. I know you, you cut, you covered it, uh, somewhat in your, in your book on, on the LDS gospel topics essays. And so I want to get your thoughts on, on that and on its effectiveness. Um, so I, I think the essay alludes to the idea that the ban was a, a byproduct of 19th century racial climate. Um, I think you can get that from it. Um, but it doesn't come right out and, and say that. The language is a bit ambiguous. And I, I'm a little, um, I guess I, I, wor I worry about its effectiveness when the gospel topics essay really gets little to no um, major attention, I think. I think you do hear from time to time leaders of the church will, will mention the gospel topics essays generally, but I mean, the, the church knows how to get a message across if it really wants to. This is, this is something that could be announced, I think, in, in wards and, and, and stakes if, if they needed to. And then, and then uh, we have, you know, as recently as October of last year, President Oaks um, addressing BYU and um, to his credit, talking about Black Lives Matter, and I think that that was a big deal. But I caught I caught some language discussing the ban in terms of something God ordained, uh, even still. And so, I don't know if this has uh, turned into a, a statement or a question, but I wanted to get your thoughts on some of that and and on the the gospel topics essay generally, whether or not you you feel like it goes far enough. Well, so 
the fact that President Oaks has referred to the ban as God ordained in a few public sermons, it tells you that not everybody's on the same page, right? Right, yeah. And there are some folks in the LDS Black community who just absolutely cringe when well-intentioned white Latter-day Saints appeal to the Bible to justify the ban. They just cringe. Yeah. The reason why they cringe is because that says that God ordained the ban. And they don't believe that. And so when the, the, the gospel, when the race and priesthood essay was published in 2013, the, um, the timing is really critical. Just want to take a step back the previous year. And Mitt Romney is running for the presidency. And of course, he's getting bombarded with the church's racial teachings. And I'm going to be critical of Mitt Romney for a quick moment. Mitt Romney didn't have the the chutzpah like his father did. His father addressed civil rights head on in the 1960s. And Mitt Romney never wanted to talk about his church at all, which I thought was unfortunate. You know, he was a bishop. He had met with widows. He really had um, met with the youth, of course. He had a, a platform to sort of lighten um, the church's image a little bit, talking about the service that he rendered towards, you know, widows or youth. And he didn't do it. He just, his campaign reached a strategy that we're not going to talk about it. And so when somebody asked him about race, his church's teachings on race, he didn't want to engage. What he would say is, um, I support civil rights. Now think about that for a moment. Mr. Romney, we're not asking you about civil rights. We're asking you about our black people curse. Do you believe that? Right. And if so, talk about it, because you're going to be the president or possibly. And we want to know, where do you stand on these things? He didn't want to didn't want to engage. And he uh, recognized that it was controversial. And so he just sort of ignored it. And um, so during the, the interview or during his presidency in 2012, his presidential aspirations, um, there was a reporter from The Washington Post named Jason Horowitz, who flew to BYU. And he wanted to get some background inf information on Romney, who had attended BYU. And uh, so Horowitz started knocking on doors at BYU. Anybody who would talk to him in the religion department, just literally. And they would say, who are you? I'm Jason Horowitz, Washington Post. No, thank you. Because you're supposed to go through the university channels and get approved and all that. He didn't do that. I don't even know if he knew that. Well, anyway, so he kept on knocking on doors and several people told him no, they denied the interview. And one of them opened up the door, oh, come on in. This is a guy named Randy Bott, who is a popular professor at BYU. And, and anyway, Bott, uh, they started talking about the interview and or about Romney and the church's teachings. And then all of a sudden, Bott brought up race. This wasn't even on Horwich's radar. Bott brought it up. And he started quoting from the first presidency statement of 1970 that God has always been discriminatory towards blacks. This is what the 70 statement says. He's quoting that. And God discriminates who he gives the priesthood to. And black children or black uh, people, black men are like little children wanting to drive a car. You wouldn't give the keys to a little child to drive a car. Why would you give blacks the priesthood? They're not ready for it. So he's, he's, he's just going all these offensive tropes. And Horowitz, of course, recognizes being the clear-eyed reporter that he is. He's like, oh my goodness, I've got a story here. Whoa. Right. So, I mean, he had no idea and uh, that, that Mormons taught this. And so anyway, so he kept asking questions and Horowitz or uh, Bot kept digging a deeper grave. And anyway, so the Washington Post blasts this story. Mitt Romney is embarrassed to no end. The church is embarrassed because they were already on high alert during the campaign that they were worried about, you know, the typical questions, polygamy and race and the priesthood. And so they already had a PR campaign to combat all of this. And anyway, um, so, so it makes the Washington Post, the church denounces bot by name in a public relations statement. I mean, they threw the guy under the bus. And I feel bad for, for Brother Bot because he thought he was still teaching church doctrine. One of his colleagues told me once that he went rogue. He didn't go rogue. You really think, listen to what you're saying. Do you think a BYU religion professor would go rogue? Give me a break. Right. He obviously, Bot obviously did not 
did not understand the shifting winds that you probably ought not to talk about these controversial teachings during the midst of a high profile Mormon running for the president, but he didn't do that. Well, anyway, so none of this stuff had ever been renounced. And so Bob just talked about it like it was nothing, not recognizing how a reporter like Horowitz, a Jewish man, would, would take this. Mm-hmm. And so obviously, um, when the church denounces him in two separate public relations statements, I'm, I haven't spoken to Bob, I want to interview him, but um, I'm sure it crushed him. And he left BYU shortly thereafter. Well, having said all of that, the church is now in a pickle. We've got to produce an authoritative statement getting rid of these terrible teachings. And for years, um, the church had been confronted mostly by Black Latter-day Saints to do this in the 1990s in particular, where people would go in with Mormon doctrine to President Hinckley and say, how could you do this? This is terrible. And President Hinckley um, and some of the other brethren, they didn't want to they didn't want to remove Mormon doctrine from print. And they would say stuff like, well, the church isn't racist. Well, then why don't you remove Mormon doctrine? And the answer is for, for two reasons. And this is why the race and priesthood essay is controversial, why they waited to release it, is because they didn't want people to think that the brethren were wrong in teaching doctrine. They'd been teaching this stuff for all these years. And all of a sudden, the race and priesthood essay says, no, we don't teach this. And that's hugely problematic because the church, of course, teaches that the the, the Lord won't allow um, the brother to lead the church astray. Right. Kind of like, you know, papal infallibility, right? Yeah. The Pope cannot err when he's pronouncing doctrine. Right. And um, anyway, so that's the first reason why they won't denounce McConkie or racial teachings. The second reason is, is because the brethren operate like a big family, the 12 in the first presidency, who are sort of in a league of their own when it comes to leadership. The mm-hmm. 70s and everybody else is quite down here. Didn't used to be that way. But now there's a bigger chasm between the two groups. The 70s used to be closer to the top than they are now. But anyway, um, the 12 and the first presidency, they operate like a big family. Some really, really like each other and some don't. But at the end of the day, they're still family. You protect your own. And so that was President Hinckley. I'm told by a couple of people um, off the record, meaning I can't put it in my book, but um, that he didn't like McConkie's book at all. Mm. And uh, he, he I, from one person who works at the church, he said, quote, McConkie gave us a pile of poop and we're still scooping up after it. And because right. Mormon doctrines caused the church a lot of problems. Yeah. Anyway, um, so, but they don't want to remove it from print in the 1990s, even though it's causing damage in the black community. And, um, you know, again, it's fair game. If you go to the desert bookstore, the church's bookstore or BYU or anywhere, sponsored by the church, you can buy this book and, you know, you just think it's the church doctrine. Oh, who knew that Black people were cursed? Right. And this is what's going on, that Black Latter-day Saints who are converting to the church, they're fighting this stuff through Mormon doctrine as they purchase it from the bookstore. And they have a faith crisis instantly. Yeah. Because this new church they've, you know, come to love and embrace, it, there's an underside to it with the race stuff. And President Hinckley, of all people, knows that it's controversial but he's kind of caught between two different vectors, if you will. The one would be, we don't want to renounce it because it'll embarrass the, the apostle and his family, even if the apostle's dead, right? Mm-hmm. It still may embarrass his family. Um, but two, we've got Black Latter-day Saints who, who continue to express anguish over this doctrine. And um, so by 2013, they recognize, this is after a year after the Washington Post story, they recognize we've got to denounce this once and for all. We've got to do it. And if people, if it causes a hardship and you know, a testimony, we've got to do it. And so the brethren were very, very sensitive to releasing not just this essay, but other essays. They're trying to come clean because people are leaving the church over this perception that the church is hiding its history. Right. And so the brother want to say, look, we're not hiding our history. Look what we've acknowledged here. But yet they don't want to broadcast it at general conference or they don't want the bishops and the state presidents um, to talk about it over the pulpit. And they just want, if a, if a questioning Latter-day Saint goes into the bishop and says, look, I'm having a trouble with polygamy or race or whatever, the bishop can say, well, we've got these essays. We're not hiding anything. Look. 
But when they first did the essays, they made them like three clicks away on the internet. They were very hard to find. And they recognized, um, this is in the first two years roughly of the release of the essays. And so they recognized two years into it that they couldn't do that, it wasn't working. Because for a lot of reasons, it wasn't working. Um, in Hawaii, for example, there was a, a white man, um, I think he's Caucasian, who's married to a black woman in their Hawaii ward. And this white Latter-day Saint was teaching the youth and for the race, I don't know what the lesson was, but he appealed to the gospel topics essay on race. And the bishop didn't know anything about the essays and released him from his calling for teaching mm -hmm. from unauthorized sources. And of course, you know, he said, well, the first presidency approved this. And the bishop didn't believe it. Right. So anyway, stories like that began to circulate and the brother and recognize, oh my goodness, we've got a problem. And so, so what they decided to do is, um, they decided to, to really hit it pretty good to the youth. Those are the people in college age, Latter-day Saints. Those the, that's the demographic they were targeting. And so what they did is they, they told BYU religion instructors, CES instructors, start talking about these essays. And we don't care about the 85 year old guy in Honduras. We don't care about him. We don't care about the you know, 65 year old guy in Boston. We don't care about him. We want the youth. So they started to, to work it into the curriculum and manuals. They put it into the Saints series, this new series that they, their pu church is publishing. And um, then you, Elder Ballard has talked about it in public a little bit to a youth fireside group. So they're so slowly starting to get the word out. But to answer your question about the ban, Nick, is that there was a lot of discussion about how far they should go with the race and priesthood essay. Now, if you read the statement, like you implied, it, um, it's ambiguous about how the ban began. It says it began with Brigham Young, but we still don't know, was it God inspiring Brigham Young or was it born out of racism in 19th century slavery America, right? And um, my brother told me years ago when it came out, we talked about this, he's got a doctorate degree and three master's degrees. He's a well-educated guy. He's in a state presidency. And he read the ban and he didn't read what I wrote or read what I read. Mm -hmm. And since I know how the document came about, I know the authors who produced it. So I had some inside knowledge, but the fact that my brother's a good reader and didn't understand tells you that they, the message was blurred and that was by design. And uh, I'm a college professor. And so I always teach my students, if you write something and someone reads it and they don't know what you're saying, it's either a commentary on their reading skills or your writing skills. <laughs> And 99% of the time, it's a commentary on your writing skills. That you, you need to write, you know, simple declarative prose to get people to understand your message. And, and the, the folks who wrote this document, it wasn't that they were, are poor writers. I don't, they're not. It's just that they just had to be very careful about how much they admitted because they didn't want to create a faith crisis in some Latter-day Saints. Yeah, I think it has, it still has effects. And I think to, uh, to, to fail to... Um, I guess, appreciate, learn the lesson from what got us here is, is, is not doing us any favors. I would, I would hope to see something change. Um, do you imagine a time, I'm asking you to speculate again, do you imagine a time where we'll see a, a full-blown apology or something to that effect? Not, not with today's leadership. In right. 2015, President Oaks, or I guess he was Elder Oaks then, but in 2015, Elder Oaks said that, that we don't give apologies no, we don't seek apologies, nor do we give them. Right. And I, I was disappointed, to be honest, when I heard that, because it, um, I think an apology would go a long way. And with some people who continue to suffer because of the, the residual effects of racism, and just to put this in comparative perspective, that in 1994, the Presbyterian National Synod had issued an apology about their, their racism in the past. Oh, really? 19, 1995, this is the decade of racial reconciliation. 1995, the Baptists got on record for their role in slavery and segregation. Mm -hmm. In 2000, the Methodists followed suit. In 2001, the Catholics had reaffirmed their, their they'd already done this before, but they reaffirmed that they were sorry for their role in racism. So all of these other religions are doing this. Um, Bob Jones University 
apologized in 2008. So n neither BYU nor the church has apologized. And I think, you know, it goes back to this idea again of, you know, if you apologize, that means that you were wrong. And it plays into this idea that the Lord won't lead the church astray. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this is about. It's unfortunate because I can, I, I don't like to be critical, but it's unfortunate because I think people can handle an apology. I think we, as human beings, we relate to people who can admit wrong, right? We were wrong. We were so sorry. And it's not a hard sell either, right? right. I mean, in the 1930s and 40s or whatever your views on race at that time, I mean, my goodness, the, the, this country had some horribly repressive views on race in the 20th century. And Latter-day Saints were no different. And, um, and the difference is, you know, a lot of uh, Protestant churches are coming to grips with civil rights and their racial heritage in the 1960s during the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. right? Dr. King's calling him to repentance. And the church, of course, is a decade late to the, to the table. And I, I think I explained why. Right. Yeah. It wasn't because of President Kimball. It's because he had some people he had to work with in the leadership to get them to support it. But I think that if the church would go on record and, and support, uh, offer an apology and make some significant um, reforms at BYU and throughout the church, it would go a long way to making the church a more inviting place for people of color. So, you know, a lot of times, Nick, when, when the church um, talks, you know, Eller Oaks or President Nelson or whomever, you know, don't be a racist, right? And that's, the, you know, we can always applaud those talks, those sermons, because we need to hear them over and over again, especially with what we witness. The problem is, is that nobody thinks that they're a racist, right? Right. And, you know, you can quote scripture after scripture that God loves everybody equally, but you've got to be able to have racial sensitivity training. You know you're a racist if... Yeah, you think that black skin is a sign of a divine curse. Don't say that. That's racist. Right. Well, of course, all lives matter, but all lives are not being brutally and systematically killed by traffic stops. Right. It's right. black folk. And when you say that all lives matter, you are not associating with their pain. And so there's a, there's a, you know, there's a lot to, that goes into this, but that's, that's the issue is that most people in my experience in the church, um, they don't think they're a racist. And therefore, when someone says, you know, President Nelson or President Oaks, when they say, you know, give a talk of uh, denouncing racism, it just goes right over their heads. You know, Brother Jones, he's talking to you, right? That's, that's the problem. And so, um, you know, I, I really, I do, I believe this with every inch of my being today that, that I don't think this is going to change until the brethren keep at it, but be more specific. And uh, we, we, I don't want to change the subject, but Elder Oaks's conference talk on the Constitution was, was mm -hmm. good in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a Republican in order to be a good church member. Right. That's reading the tea leaves, right? I'm happy President Oaks said that because Latter-day Saints overwhelmingly still support the Republican Party, and they think that you have to be a good member to do that. But I wish he would have gone one step further and said, you know, if you're indulging in conspiracy theories, stop! But he stopped at that. Like, ah, right. <laughs> you're <were> almost there. <laughs> we're almost there. And anyway, but uh, but but racial sensitivity, I think, is needed. And I know at BYU, they're um, if you've seen the report that they're they're calling for a, a building after a slave owner to be renamed, possibly. Right. They're calling for some segregationist buildings to be renamed. You know, I don't think that's going to happen. I just don't. Uh, they're not going to remove the Harold B. Lee Library name or the Reuben Clark or the Benson or they just won't but i think what you will see happen is um that they will require all students to take you know a, a course in ethnic diversity and it's amazing to me that how many you know kids in the latter-day saint community they they just a lot of it's driven by conservative politics right mm -hmm. what i call the fox news effect um but they get their views from fox news about how to demonize people of color right and, um, but if we, if BYU requires this course in racial diversity, hopefully it could expose them to different voices and different literature that probably only a small fraction of BYU students get if they take an ethnic literature class or a class in, you know, the history department where I graduated from. Um, but now this is one of the reforms is let's make everybody do this class. And I think that's a great start. Right. 
And I think it's through conversations, you know, like this too. And um, I, I think we see a shift already in, in, in what people uh, expect of their institutions, what people expect of, of people who, um, you know, claim to speak for God. You know, I, I think we'll continue to see that change as, as people's expectations change, as people become more aware. You know, I'd say one, one last thing, Nick. Yeah. Um, you know, the, President Nelson, I think, in the church, they, they've done some remarkable things, I think, in the 21st century. Um, mm-hmm. I, they didn't apologize, and I'm not happy about that. I don't think they will for the reasons I stated. But I, I do see the 21st century as an era of racial reconciliation in a different way, in that the church is, um, is meeting with the NAACP to meet the needs of members of the Black community. Right. I think that's significant, especially if you go back in the 1960s when you know, a senior apostle was calling the NAACP communist organization, right? So this is, this is amazing progress. I think that um, the church has is, is tried to, um, they've listened to some of the complaints from black members. This is 2013, uh, the race and priesthood document. Um, in 2010, just three years earlier than that, they got rid of Mormon doctrine. So I do see some remarkable progress um, with the church trying to elevate its, its it's sort of tone towards persons of color. I don't, in my opinion, we're not quite there yet. Um, but, but I do think that we should always celebrate uh, progress when, when it's warranted. So. Agreed. But yeah, they do. It's funny. They do. They do read scholarship. They do. That's right. read, they, they read what we write and believe it or not, they listen to podcasts. Yeah. I know this for a fact, because I've <laughs> talked to some of the PR people. Oh, I heard you on that podcast. <laughs> right like, oh great i hope i behave myself <laughs> exactly so, <laughs> yeah they, they they pay attention and the church the the brother and the leaders they um they don't the brother don't have time of course to listen to podcasts but they have people do it for them and they want to keep a, a pulse on what the church is doing and sometimes you know people are critical oh they're out of touch i i can assure you from interviewing with some of the pr people over the years they know what's going on they read they listen to podcasts and they read blogs that's what they told me so I said, well, good for you. I mean, yeah. I'm glad. That's good that you, you're keeping a pulse because, and they, of course, surprised the brethren of what's going on. So I think that's a good thing. Any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Do you want to uh, give us any more information about your upcoming book? I know a lot of people are excited about it. Yeah. So just to be clear, the, the first book that you were referencing came out a few years ago, right. and it's a collection of documents on Mormons and race that a colleague and good friend and I put together, and it's got, uh, each document has a contextual essay talking about the significance of the document, how it was received in the church, and um, happy to note that Desert Books sold the book for a while until, (laughs) I guess, my book was a casualty of President Nelson's statement that they didn't want to sell uh, books with the name Mormon in the title any longer. So, since my, my book is called The Mormon Church in Blacks, this is before the title was a bad name um so but they were selling it desert book and uh and then they got rid of all the titles with mormon uh the second book that i'm working on now will be published in 2022 and it's a detailed look at um at the church and race and the priesthood ban it talks about the 19th century how the band got started and all of that but really its strengths are in the 20th and 21st centuries and I've had access to multiple uh, diaries and journals of the Brethren, First Presidency Meeting Minutes. So I've got really good source material. And it's, um, it was really, really important for me to talk about not just the ban from an institutional perspective, you know, that is the Brethren, but also how did this ban affect people in the pews, people who went to church and were worshiping, believing Latter-day Saints. And obviously I, I needed, I wanted, Black voices. I right. wanted to talk about their stories, their experiences, what it was like being a Black Latter-day Saint. So I've got plenty of instances and documents and oral histories from Black Latter-day Saints who um, talk about living with the ban and then living in the church after the ban was lifted and how that continued to affect them both positively and, and even negatively. And yeah. that's uh, slated for uh, release, maybe I think you said 2022? 
or so. Yeah, probably 2022 is what I'm thinking about. I'm just finishing the last chapter now and should oh. have it in no time. Look forward to it, definitely. Well, good, Nick. Thanks for a nice chat with you today. All right. Thanks, Matt. You bet. Thank you.